Hello everybody, this is Troy, and in this video I would like to just spend some time and show you my finishing process uh, when I'm working on my puzzles. And uh, the end result, uh, even though I, I do all 3D printing on my puzzles, uh, the end result, uh, often people are just amazed that it's actually 3D printed. Uh, and I want to show you how I, how I achieve these results. Uh, if you look at this puzzle, you won't see any uh, print lines, things that people would normally see a puzzle or, or feel when they're turning it. This turns very much like a, a non-3D printed puzzle. Um, <clears throat> and it just looks great, turns great. So uh, let, me, uh, let me get started here. So a lot of my puzzles, uh, like this one, have parts that are not completely flat. Um, and there's really no good way to print those on your print bed uh, when you're 3D printing. Uh, a puzzle like this, it has flat areas and I can choose to have this piece uh, down on the bed when, when I print so that it has something to print up off of. Uh, but when you work with unusual shapes, uh, that's not always the case. And a puzzle like this definitely uh, did not have any flat surfaces to use. So I'm gonna show you parts from another puzzle I'm working on and <clears throat> this one again has no flat areas. Um, so this part that's in question is this piece right here. And this is a center cap actually, but if you look at it, you'll see there is just nothing. Uh, these pieces right here are flat, so you could you could maybe print up like this uh, down, but there's just such an unusual shape. What I end up doing for a shape like this is I make a structure uh, of support. And a lot of uh, slicers for 3D printing will add these automatically, but I like to do them manually. Uh, to have the least amount of contact that's going to affect my part. Um, so in this case, this is the support structure uh, off of this piece, and it just snaps off when it's done. So what this did is it just fit right there, uh, this way around, uh, fit this way, and it just held that piece up while it was being printed uh, in this orientation. And that orientation I determined to not have any overhangs or anything, so I didn't need any other supports. So straight off the printer, that part looks like this. Uh, you can see it's it's got this piece down below, uh, and that's just how it comes out. So for me, the first part of finishing a part is actually starting a part, uh, getting as much quality in that part from your print as you can. Uh, I've also printed this to the the higher setting of my printer uh, takes twice as long, but I find that the actual finishing process is much better because the little lines and grooves that I want to get rid of are much smaller. Uh, so that all helps. <clears throat> so the first thing I'm going to do when I grab a piece, and uh, once, I've, once I've taken off the, the support material, and I'll generally use something uh, like a small needle nose pliers or these small little clippers, and you can just get in there and you just clip away and everything just breaks off very easily uh, when you do that. And you're presented with a piece like this. Now, a lot of people will use sandpaper. Uh, sandpaper is great, does a good job. Um, I've got this piece here of 150 grit. Uh, I'll speak about this sandpaper in a little bit. Um, if, you, if you start sanding on a piece right away, um, you're gonna notice, uh, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna start seeing it, you'll see these lines and, and People that do sand a lot just don't go far enough to get rid of these lines. Um, what I like to do, instead of using the sandpaper first, is I use these little needle files. And you can get these in packs uh, at the hardware store. Some hobby stores have them. Um, usually I find them in packs of 8 or 10, uh, something like this. And they'll be about $10 for an assorted um, assortment. So I've got a large number of these. <clears throat> it comes down to... These three are the two, three that I use most often. Uh, this one is definitely my most used one. It has a, it comes to a fine point here. It's got a rounded side, which is good for uh, concave areas. And it's also got a flat surface. Uh, next would be this one, which is just flat on both sides, but it gives me a little more surface area. So if I'm dealing with a larger flat area, this is the one I go to. And then this one is actually from another set. Uh, it's flat on both sides but I find that this file is a little coarser so I can take off material a little faster uh, with this one. So that's why I use that. But <clears throat> with these files, um, you'll find you're able to, I was looking to see if I had another piece. Here's a, 
this one's a little easier to sand, so I'm going to grab it. Uh, again, on this corner, I've I've printed this in a way uh, to have the best possible print on all sides to start with. Uh, and I've done that by, I actually gave this a support structure like this to start with. So it printed, this was the bed and it printed up and it gave me this little support piece that I can just snap off. And so that little support piece, um, if I can put it on here, is just like this. And that just, that just clipped right off, boom, done. And it's gone, I discard that piece. Now, <clears throat> to file this piece, uh, I, I just need to take my file. And the nice thing about these files is they're very gentle on the plastic. Uh, I use PLA, and you can't really overdo it. Uh, well, you probably could, but just normal filing and even pushing quite hard, um, it's not really going to damage my plastic. I have to go over this several times, excuse me, uh, several times to be able to, uh, to get rid of these lines. But I find this file works much better than sandpaper because it's, it allows me to get into every little crack, every little groove um, easily. And I'm just going to do this one side here for you to show you. Um, and what you want to do is you just want to go until those lines are gone. And so right there, I've gotten rid of those lines and compared to, say, the print lines that you can see here. Now, this is already quite good. And basically what I want to do is get the entire piece all around to this quality. And my process then is when I get the pieces from that, I throw them in a bag. And I'll do every piece and I'll throw them all in this bag. And then I take all my printed pieces and they go, I do the file process, put them in a bag. And then when I'm done, I will have a bag of parts that looks like this. So these are all sanded pieces, uh, not sanded, just filed. Uh, and on all of these pieces, I've gone through everywhere and I've gotten rid of the lines as much as possible. Uh, so now at this point is when I'm going to start using my sandpaper. Now for sanding, I have a couple different tools that I like to use. And I'll start with these. Uh, these are just 3D printed uh, sandpaper uh, tools. And there are some designs for these on Thingiverse. I think these I made my, myself uh, to kind of meet my own demands. But uh, you'll find similar ones or you can make them easily enough. And they just hold a small piece of sandpaper and it gives you a nice little small sanding block that you can hold in your hands and use. Uh, and then I've got different grits, uh, 160, 320, 1000 grit. Um, and this is actually when I want to talk about this sandpaper. Uh, <clears throat> This is the best sandpaper I've ever found. Uh, it's a 3M uh, Sandblaster uh, brand, I think they call it. I will um, find an Amazon link and I'll put it down in the description for you. Um, but unlike most sandpapers, it's not paper-based. It's, it's kind of a rubbery. You can, you can see the stretch um, and it, it's very floppy and flexible. And it, you can fold it over on itself and you won't get a crack on it. I could crumple this up. Uh, and it holds its shape. Uh, it can be wet sanded. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and you can get this in generally 150. I think I've seen it in 180 and 320. Um, I wish it was available in 600, 800 type grits, but I have not seen it in those. Um, but this sandpaper, uh, I like to have a piece that's loose that I can just use in the areas that are that are maybe concave a little bit because I can just use my thumb and it just gets right in there. Now, for the sake of the video, you're not going to be able to see the difference uh, between what I'm doing here, but um, what you will do is going from the going from the file to the sandpaper here, uh, I can feel that difference. And what you want to do is you want to go over these pieces enough um, and you'll be able to feel where it's smooth and if you feel a little burr, just go over it again with the sandpaper. Now, at this point, if you if you get to a spot and you see some visible lines, um, don't don't keep using the sandpaper to get rid of that line. Just go up to your file again, go ahead and get rid of that line, and then go back to your sandpaper. And it's basically up and down the chain between between um, the the file, the sandpaper, and then going to finer and finer grit sandpaper. Uh, and ending with, the, now this is a thousand grit. This one's quite worn, so it, it's not that useful at the moment, but 
um, even with just what this is, if I use this piece for just a tiny bit on this edge, um, I think you'll be able to see here what I'm what I'm going to achieve. So look at the uh, the sheen that's coming off of this edge already, just right here, and I'll compare that to another edge that hasn't been sanded, and how dull this is. And I can definitely feel this on my thumb that this is a bit rough um, uh, versus this, which is which is very very smooth. Um, and so that's what you're looking for. And so after filing, go through the sandpapers, get everything to this level. You definitely want to focus on the edges because frankly, when you're done with your puzzle, uh, the edges are all that's going to be seen. Uh, but for the internal pieces, if you're doing a full thing like I am, uh, you want to get these insides as smooth as possible because it will definitely help the function uh, of the puzzle. Um, let me see here. Um, <clears throat> so when I talk about building supports for my for my pieces, here's another uh, example of uh, these are my center pieces, and these uh, again they don't have any flat section on them, so I've decided to build uh, this little scaffolding structure. And the great thing about this is. Um, if I print them individually, sometimes there's just not enough material to stay on the bed and the one piece will come off and I, I'll have a failed print because maybe it drags itself around on the print bed. Um, but if I'm doing six pieces like this, I'll just tie them all together in one big piece uh, because there's much less chance of a failure uh, that one little failure is going to take out everything. This, this kind of holds everything together. And then when I want to uh, start working on this piece, all I need to do is I'll just take my my snips and I'll just cut that and then um, this little piece will break off right here. There we go. And it broke off exceptionally clean. Uh, and so that's my point to start sanding. Uh, so that's just how I like to work uh, with my pieces. And then there's one final thing I will show you. And that is here's a piece uh, that is uh, finished uh, compared to um, where is it here we go uh, compared to my my freshly printed piece uh, you can see the lines in there uh, you can see how they're pretty much gone here some of these that are showing up uh, right now are actually visible on the camera but they're not very visible to me uh, by my eye uh, camera and the lighting is kind of picking up a little bit extra here um, but the trick would be to try to get that as, as smooth as possible and uh, here's one that has been just uh, just filed. It hasn't been taken to the sandpaper. But you can notice that once you sand, everything gets a little bit gray. Uh, and I've got this back to black. Now, once you go up in the grits, uh, up to a thousand, the finer and finer and finer grits you get, uh, it's going to get darker and it's going to start returning to black. Uh, there's one last trick that I do use and I, I would discourage you from using this until you're absolutely sure you're done with your piece uh, because it will make a mess of things if you do it too early. Um, but that trick is I just use a little bit of silicone lube. Uh, in my case, I just have this shock oil from uh, RC stuff. It's just a, it, the weight doesn't matter because I'm not actually lubing the cube with this. What I'm doing is I will just take a single drop of this and put it on my piece once my piece is done. Uh, and it basically just kind of uh, gives a little oil, oily surface. But at this point, um, I've rubbed it all in and it doesn't come off on my fingers or anything like that. But it helps restore uh, that shine a little bit to the pieces. Uh, if you do this a little too early, you're going to get a little bit of grime on your piece. Uh, and it'll get in those little cracks. And then if you want to try to sand away those cracks, you'll be sanding and you'll have the silicone oil in there. So, so I, I definitely discourage doing that until you're absolutely sure you're done. Um, I hope this video has helped and uh, it just kind of gives an idea of, um, of what the process is. Typically, uh, just to give you an idea of time, typically on a puzzle I probably spend about 15 minutes per piece uh, and so most of my puzzles do take me you know near you know eight to ten hours or so uh, to go through all the pieces and uh, and sand them to get a finished product but uh, uh, the effort I find to be highly worth it in the end so uh, I just wanted to share that I hope you all enjoy this thank you